Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, to share with you today uh, some of our recent uh, work in the field of uh, light emitting devices. In particular, uh, I would like to talk today about some uh, atrobimetallic complexes for application in light emitting electrochemical salts. So just a brief introduction for those of you that are not uh, really familiar with the, uh, with the topic actually. So phosphorescent transition metal complexes, they are very interesting because they possess tunable emission color uh, over the entire visible spectrum and sometimes even beyond. Uh, they have high photoluminescence quantum yield uh, and so it depends on the color, they have relatively high photoluminescence quantum yields and uh, they also possess long-lived excited state which uh, arise from the formally uh, triplet nature of the excited state. So they found very interesting application in uh, uh, outer electronic devices such, uh, such as organic light emitting diodes and light emitting electrochemical cells. And in particular, iridium-based emitters, they found current application in, uh, in market technology. So what is the challenge, even though they are uh, market, uh, market products, actually there is still some uh, uh, difficult challenges uh, and that have to be uh, problems that have to be tackled. Uh, in particular, it's very difficult to make efficient and stable near and uh, red and near infrared emitters as well as uh, blue emitters so in particular. So this means that basically the two um, uh, extreme of the visible regions are uh, very difficult to address. Uh, so what is the origin of the nature? Uh, what is the, 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 the nature of the emitting excited state, which then will help us to understand how to, uh, to provide some guidelines on uh, uh, optimize the excited state and the, and the emission properties. So in those compounds, the emission of the excited state can be, def uh, can be um, uh, defined as a linear combination of three different states. So it's a combination of a mainly uh, triplet ligand center at excited state, which actually uh, mix by uh, configuration interaction with a uh, uh, triplet method ligand charge transfer excited state, and also by means of spin orbit coupling with a singlet method to ligand charge transfer state. So the radiative rate constant, which also links, uh, is linked to the uh, photoluminescence quantum yield is also directly proportional to the third power of the emission energy along with the uh, spin orbit coupling uh, uh, matrix elements and the uh, oscillator strength of the, uh, of the compound. Um, so the problem is that uh, the, emission energy, the emission energy is intrinsically small for red and near infrared emitters, which means, uh, which brings to intrinsically small radiative rate constant. On the other hand, there is also a second parameter that has to be taken into account, which is the, derived by the energy gap law, uh, which is the non-radiative rate constant. In particular, uh, the logarithm of the non-radiative rate constant actually scales uh, with the negative of the difference between the uh, triplet excited state and the ground state, which means that the non-radiative rate constant is high for, typically high for, uh, uh, for red and near infrared emitters. So if you now look at the literature, main, uh, uh, main uh, efforts have been devoted to the uh, development of uh, um, mononuclear iridium complexes. So they are currently leading emitters, but actually the presence of a second metal may bring, uh, may bring some interesting um, uh, properties. In particular, they will help us to better modulate the redox and the optical properties to increase the structural rigidity, so to, uh, which means that now we can somehow counterbalance uh, the energy gap low by decreasing the you know, radiative rate constant. And we can, uh, we could uh, announce the spin orbit coupling. So the first example of, uh, of uh, bimetallic complexes were reported by a group of Balsani in 1992. And now the topic uh, a few years ago started to, be, uh, to become much more, uh, much more investigated in the literature, in particular, thanks to the, um, um, the examples reported by the group of Bryce and uh, Williams. Uh, Williams. 
On the other hand, uh, hetero bimetallic complexes, and in particular those contain iridium complexes, uh, iridium metal centers, they are much less, even much less explored is because, uh, so the, the, the few examples known literature, there are uh, those that I show here in the, in the slide, and it is because they require site selective reaction, uh, reactions in order to improve the, in order to improve the, <coughs> the reaction yield and also careful uh, design of the ligand and the metal on uh, the ligand environment and the metal in order to avoid metal metal electronic communication so we then wondering whether it's, if it's possible to uh, enhance the emission properties in red emitting heterobimetallic complexes so we then came across uh, we came across to uh, an interesting ligand is a Janus type ligand which possesses two different coordination sites. On one hand, the the acetyl acetonate site, which is very useful for the preparation of luminescent complexes, and on the other hand, we have the an heterocyclic carbene site, which is also very interesting because it's able to form very strong metal ligand bonds. So we then uh, uh, we then uh, use these ligands in order to prepare some um, some linear uh, some linear copper and gold complexes, biscarbine uh, complexes, which now they uh, we use in a in a further in a subsequent step for the preparation of of uh, heterobimetallic complexes in a rather uh, straightforward manner by also using site selective uh, steps. So we can then, uh, uh, we were able to straightforward prepare a series of uh, ether B metallic complexes. And here for just for a second of time, I will present just two of those in particular compound number four and five. And uh, we can compare those with, um, uh, with the monometallic counterpart compound number three. So if you look now briefly at the photophysical properties of those compounds, we can see that uh, along the series three, uh, three, four, five, we have very similar uh, absorption spectrum. In particular, for four and five, the absorption spectrum is basically superposable. We have just a tiny, uh, very small uh, isochronic shift for the uh, singlet metal to ligand charge transfer band for the uh, compound number three. So thanks to the uh, TDFT calculations, uh, we were also, by also uh, including spin orbit effects, we are also uh, able to associate those bands, uh, that band to uh, the single metal signatures transfer involving the, uh, the sacrometal ligand. On the other hand, in, uh, in, in the emission spectrum, we also observe um, uh, we also observe very similar uh, emission profiles uh, for attributed to the triplet metal to ligand charge transfer state with a very small epsochromic shift again uh, for uh, the monometallic complex. Um, if you now look at the uh, more into the detail of the photophysical properties of compound three, four, and five, and we compare that with the benchmark complex, the iridium B spicolinate ACAC that we ha I have here uh, in gray. So we can see that uh, in particular uh, compound number three versus the benchmark complex, we have very similar photophysical properties. This means very similar photoluminescence quantum yield and very similar uh, radiative rate constant. On the other hand, the benchmark versus the heterobimetallic one show very, uh, very different, uh, very, very different properties, and will help us to better understand um, uh, to gain more details into the excited state properties of those uh, heterobimetallic complexes. In particular, uh, when we go from the monometallic to the heterobimetallic ones, we have uh, in a, a almost uh, twofold increase of the photoluminescence properties. We have very similar uh, uh, excited state uh, lifetime. And more interesting, we have, uh, um, and so the, 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 the results is that and we have uh, almost twofold increase of the uh, of the radiative rate constant into the for the heterobium uh, metallic ones. So if you now uh, would like to try to understand what is the origin of such increase of the radiative rate constant, we have to go back to a definition to the quantum mechanical parameters uh, which uh, which rule uh, the radiative rate constant. And as we can see. We have, uh, when we compare the monometallic with the bimetallic, we have a comparable spin orbit coupling. Uh, 
we have comparison between our decoupling effects. This also was supported by TDDFT calculations. We have a similar uh, MLCT, the similar energy for the MLCT bands. As also we show, uh, we have some from the uh, from the experimental data. We have a similar moral excitation coefficient, so we can attribute uh, the increase of the radiative rate constant to the smaller energy gap between the single MLCT state, which mix to the triplet uh, ligand center uh, excited state. So this also was confirmed by, uh, by means of electrochemistry. As we can see, we have a stabilization of the redox potential, the oxidation potential of the, which is metal center. We now we have now uh, further uh, expanded this series and by introducing different cyclometallic ligands in particular we uh, now would like to talk about compound number uh, six and seven and also in this case uh, for compound number seven we now uh, have much higher photoluminescence quantum mill so we now start to approach very interesting values of photoluminescence quantum mill uh, while keeping the, uh, the emission into the, uh, into the red. So what is the origin of this uh, increase of such high uh, photoluminescence quantum yield? So if you now look, uh, if you now compare the compound number six and seven with the corresponding uh, mononuclear complex, uh, the, the benchmark complex here, as, um, as we can see, uh, they have, the all of three, they have a very similar uh, excited state lifetime, but uh, again, there is a, uh, about 50%, uh, more than 50% increase of the photoluminescence quantum mean, and we have uh, uh, at the same time, uh, increase of the radiative rate constant for the, uh, the metallic complexes and a decrease of the non-radiative rate constant. Um, also in this case, we confirm the, the we rule out the um, actually we rule out the, 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 the involvement of the second metal by uh, uh, all uh, by uh, TDFT calculations. Uh, so prompted by, uh, prompted by uh, our uh, by our results and by those interesting photo uh, photoluminescence quantum mills, we started to investigate those compounds as uh, electroactive materials in light emitting electrochemical cells. Uh, just for sake of time, I will show you now uh, uh, the results of the host gas uh, device architecture. So we, uh, we, uh, we use a host complex, wider energy uh, host complex and uh, our complex as a, a guest uh, EL materials at uh, only 5%. So these devices were uh, fabricated in collaboration with Professor Su in Taiwan. So as we can see, we have uh, uh, also for the light emitting devices, we have uh, um, uh, still uh, red emission and we now reach uh, external quantum efficiencies up to, uh, up to 6%. 6%, which uh, uh, are, uh, so our devices actually uh, are uh, currently the, uh, the second best uh, red emitting, light emitting electrochemical cells, which are, um, uh, which were fabricated to date. So uh, in conclusion, I hope that I was able to convince you that uh, I hope that I was able to convince you that uh, it's possible by using uh, uh, a metallic approach. It is possible to, uh, to have an announcement of the radiative rate constant and an increase of the photoluminescence quantum yield in those uh, triplet emitters in particular into the, uh, into the red and uh, deep red region. So those compounds now they, uh, they represent and they are promising candidates for application in light emitting devices. We are now currently moving uh, again by using this ethyl metallic approach, moving more into the uh, newer infrared region. And here I show just briefly one of our uh, latest results. So this actually brings me um, uh, to the last slide of, uh, of my talk of today, in particular, the most important slide actually, uh, which are uh, uh, the people that actually um, mainly contributed to the, to the work that actually 
did the work in the lab. So I would like to thank uh, my, uh, my PhD student, uh, Anna, and also all the collaborators which, uh, for, uh, which um, uh, supported us, supported the project uh, at different, uh, different level, in particular, Stefan and Vincent, for uh, providing us the, uh, the interesting ligand, and Federico for uh, electrochemistry, and Chantal and Christophe for supporting us uh, um, and with the TDDFT. I also would like to thank Professor Su for the device fabrication and the uh, funding agencies, and of course, uh, all of you uh, for your kind attention.